I don't know if I would have really gotten the job if I didn't take that first step in introducing myself before I even applied. So um, that was a, a great pivot for me because the organization now, we do some work on maternal health, but it's like an all encompassing, like you get to touch on every time kind, of, kind of topic there is. And that was great for me. It's like every day I'm learning something new. It's it's challenging, but in a good way, and it keeps my mind working. And for me, that's important to be in a job where I'm using, I'm using my brain. I have to think. I have to think critically, and I just have to um, just figure things out. Um, and I think that's that's a big part of growing for me. And I never want to stop growing. And if I feel like my growth has been stunted or it's it's just stopped then that's when i talk to myself i'm like okay maybe it's time to try something different this is the public health millennial career stories podcast where you'll hear about diverse career stories career strategies get tips and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey if you want to learn about public health public health careers or just hear public health stories stay tuned because you won't want to miss this Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 74. Hi, everyone. Omari Richards here. Thank you all so much for joining me once again for another great Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at the PH Millennial. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast, leave a review, leave a like if you're on YouTube, um, share it with a friend. Greatly helps the show get out to more people and it helps me help more people in their public health careers so i appreciate that and if you'd like to support you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ph millennial and support there but i enjoyed this episode a lot I, I love how she is very proactive in all the things that she has done and she gives very good advice especially for students especially for people who just started the mph programs i think like this interview will be very helpful for you on your journey as well as all the others so don't don't not listen to all the others with this one especially and i think uh i think she has a, a story similar to a lot of people in public health going into biology then finding her way into public health and just learning more about how she can get involved in there and now has a consulting business which is also helping public health students and professionals so tap into that too if you're interested uh show notes well, all, all the links will be in the description or in the show notes. So click on that and check that out as well. Um, but enjoy the episode. Today, we have a health policy professional with a focus on African-American and Latino health inequities, community engagement, and integrating social determinants of health into health legislation. She got her Bachelor's of Science in Nutritional Sciences at Penn State University, then got her Master's of Public Health at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. She's currently a manager of federal affairs at NCQA, as well as the CEO and founder of Live Consulting and Career Services, a career services business primarily serving students and professionals in public health around all their career needs. We have Olivia Umaran, MPH. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Omari. I'm excited to be here and looking forward to having a very wonderful conversation about all things health policy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I love just hearing new stories. I love when people come on as like uh, with both their, their their public health experience as well as like their public health consulting experience. I feel like it's always fascinating to hear how they got there as well. It just gives everyone two kind of perspectives in the interview, both like the career journey as well as like starting this this other business type thing that you have going on there. So I'm looking forward to it as well, just to say that. Um, so how, how are you doing and how have you been coping during, the, during these times? I'm good for the most part. Um, I really can't complain, but it's it's definitely been tough. And I think most people have the same sentiments, but I definitely would not have imagined completing my, or I guess the second half of my master's program remotely and in the way that it was it was given, but um, not gonna lie, I'm glad that school is over. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I can't complain, but it's definitely been um, interesting navigating this, this new normal for us. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't even imagine being a student and uh, having to deal with, especially like I feel like people who were on campus and then had to switch to online for the for the remainder of their, their course yeah. time. It, that must have been very, very difficult, as well as like all the lost opportunities, because especially public health, it's so like community oriented and right. there's a lot there's a lot that was lost during the pandemic. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing well and uh, we are in a place that we can still have this interview and Congratulations on graduating during the pandemic as well. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> pandemic <most> graduate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're most welcome. And I'm definitely going to ask you more about uh, the perspective of having been in person and then online for your MPH uh, when we get to that part of the interview. Sure. Um, yeah, so tell me, how do you identify and then tell us a little bit about your personal background? Identify like... People say pronouns, people say like, their race, the way they're from, people say different things. And I leave it open to interpretation. Okay. So, okay. Uh, well, I'm Nigerian American. So that's firstly how I always identify. Um, but born and raised in, in Boston. So that's, that's my hometown. And now I'm, I'm in the DC area. So there's my, my little comprehensive <laughs> tell me about yourself sentence. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Nice and concise as well. <laughs> uh, uh, what does public health mean to you? Mm. Public health means a lot of things, but I think my, my first thought when it comes to public health is really just assisting the community in, in any way that's, that's possible um, when it comes to having better health outcomes. So even though I'm on the health policy side, the reason why I came to the health policy side was because I realized that a lot of the policies that are in place have direct effects on the community. So what I wanted to do was to be able to sit at those tables to have a voice and maybe even insert the community's voice when it comes to discussing those pieces of legislation or different policies that would would affect um, the population as a whole. Okay, awesome, awesome. I like that a lot. And I don't think I've had like too many people come on here and talk about health policy. And another thing is like when when a lot of students say health policy, a lot of them don't know what they mean. A lot because I feel like a lot of people are coming to me and like, oh, I want to do health policy. And then I I then we speak some more and it's more like quality control kind of stuff, like actually yeah. like policies within an organization rather yeah. than like yeah. overarching policies. So, right. so so I'm glad to have you on to, to clarify this for a lot of students because I know that is uh an area that gets and uh, just a lot misunderstood. So so I'm glad for that. So tell tell me more about actually I'm gonna ask you later on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you started your, your collegiate career as a Bachelor of Science, Nutritional Sciences at Penn State University. So uh -huh. what was the thought process on this? So I will start by saying that I always wanted to be a physician and that was my thought process. I originally majored in biology, but then I switched it to nutrition after my biology professor asked me why I was majoring in biology. And I said, because I wanted to go to med school. And he was like, well, if that's the only reason you're majoring in biology. Maybe you should pick something different. So I took my first nutrition class and I said, wow, OK, this is something that is not only good for me to take as a class if I want to be a physician, but also for my personal knowledge that I got to learn a lot of things that are important, I think, for everybody to learn. So did that and took all of my necessary medical school classes graduated and started to prepare for medical school applications, took the MCAT twice, applied to post back programs, got in. And it was when I got in that I was like, do I really want to do this? <laughs> People started asking me, hey, how's, how's the applications going? Are you excited? This, that. And I realized that I started dreading when people were asking me those questions and I had to sit down with myself. I said, Olivia, do you really want to be a doctor? Like what, what is the reason why you want to be a doctor? And the reason was what I found in public health, which was still to be able to make a difference in the health space. But I thought the only way I could do that was through having a medical degree. And ironically, I was speaking with a physician at a job I had at Mass General, and she also had her MPH. And I was sitting with her and she was asking me the same questions I was asking myself. 
do you really want to do this? Like, are you sure? And I said, no, I'm not sure. She said, if you're not 100% sure, definitely get into public health. It's uh, less money. Um, <laughs> it's less amount of years in school and probably a little less stress. So that's what I did. And I've never looked back since. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, th thank you for sharing that. And and I could only imagine, like, also for me, went into school biology major, wanted to be a physician as well. Um, I could only imagine, like, um, both like my parents and just like society in like, being from a Caribbean, Caribbean background, being from a Nigerian background. That that's like what a lot of our parents I think look up to and yeah. say, oh, the physician is like the the epitome of society right. and like you're, you're like the highest strong but then when you actually dig into it and you actually look and see for yourself oh I, I do want to like help people and do all these kinds of things but a lot of people just didn't have the word or the understanding for public health or knowledge of it as a field and, yeah. I, and I think like this podcast and just public health on a whole just being on Instagram and everyone just being more aware of it I think is it, it's very beneficial for the field and I'm I'm glad because I, I was I fell into public health thankfully um and I get I, just a lot of people I feel like fall into public health it's like along their path in a very strange strange way so yeah, so, so really... tell me yeah sorry if you're gonna say something oh can... no go ahead I was just agreeing with what you were saying <laughs> yeah so so you said that you started in biology and then your professor was like why do you want to do why do you want to do biology and you said because because you want to become a physician and then he's like you don't have to do biology, be a biology major to do that. When, when did that happen in your journey? That happened my freshman year of college. <laughs> so it happened literally right after I finished intro to biology, which I was never really a big fan of biology. Like I didn't mind it, but I didn't like it enough to really sit down and study it. So I was just doing it because that's what I thought I had to do. So yeah, he was real candid with me and he said, listen, I'm on the board for medical school. And anytime I see biology major, I'm like, give us something different. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'll go and choose something different. And that's when I found nutrition. So um, it, was, uh, it was quite an interesting journey. Like I think even before I had officially chosen biology, I chose pre-med because that's what makes the most sense. But then when you think about it, if you do decide not to go to med school, what are you going to do with a pre-med pre degree? <laughs> so that was my thought process when it came to changing my major. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Like I, I graduated biology pre-med and then it's like, what can you do? And thankfully I found like public health, which was kind of, <laughs> kind of related and thankfully I found yeah. it. But for the most part, when you do do that, and, and I think it's also key that your professor, whoever said that, give us something different because I feel like there are a lot of non well probably everyone in med medical school this day is like a non-traditional medical student because it's just yeah. so so difficult to get in and I think just that perspective of having something different because I feel like even the basis of the the biology and everything that you do is not really relevant to medical school it's relevant for the MCAT but it's not really relevant to 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 med school and, and actually helping people so it's a very like I'm 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 very I feel a way around like the medical system and how how it is oh, set up and medical <laughs> and all that. But but that, we don't have to talk about that today. We're, we're here to talk about public health. Uh, so so when when you switch, did did you know about public health in undergrad? Because you said it was kind of like okay, you didn't know about. It. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll I'll come back to that afterwards. Then okay. So <laughs> during during your undergrad time, you had two clinical internships and two nutritional internships. So I'll just let you talk about those. Sure. So those internships, I actually just outright asked for them. And all four I, of them? Yes, all four of them. Uh, and it's what I tell other students and my now clients is when you're looking for different opportunities, when you're looking for internships, you don't have to limit yourself to the ones that are posted on LinkedIn, Indeed, or given to you through a school email you can just find an organization that you're interested in. And if you're willing to work for free, that's, that's, the, that's the downside. So if you're willing to work for free, so many different teams are looking for a student to help them out with what they have going on. And if you just send them an email saying, hey, I'm interested in this, I wanna learn more. These are the skills that I can bring to you and help you do what you're doing. And then in return, I can just learn from you. 
most people end up saying saying yes. So all four of those, they were at Boston Children's, uh, Brigham and Women's, WIC, and Perkins School for the Blind. So all four of those were really just me reaching out to people saying, this is what I'm interested in. I want to learn more. And those clinical internships, even though I didn't end up going to medical school, they were helpful for me in understanding why I didn't want to go to medical school. So uh, I was able to watch like open heart surgeries and um, watch C-sections and, and vaginal births. And it was cool, but I was like, I don't think I really see myself coming to the hospital <laughs> seeing this every day. Um, and it was helpful too to talk to physicians and get their day-to-day um, stories of how their lives are. And again, I was like, I need a little bit more flexibility in my life. <laughs> um, so yeah, those, those internships, they were really more so informative internships, not necessarily things that I, I delivered products for, but they were all helpful in terms of bettering my understanding of what I wanted to do, or at least going a little bit closer to it, because those internships were before I found out about public health. Yeah, and I think that that is like key insights there in itself. Well, firstly, for saying that you reached out and everyone doesn't have to like, you don't have to see a, a job posting or an internship internship posting to actually reach out and, and get an opportunity. And something that I'll add to that list is like, Every, every county basically has a bunch of different task force that are doing different things. And a lot of the time, the people on this task force are very busy with a lot of different things. If you offer to do like a needs assessment or some sort of focus group or any kind of like just using your skills, that is something that is of value that people would, would help you with. That's also going to help you in your journey. But going back to my first like thought there was that, that it's just so important to, especially as undergrad students, I feel like we... We think we know what we know, <laughs> but we don't. And it, it's so important to get those experiences to really understand what 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 it is that we are getting into. And as you said, you 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 didn't uh, learn things that you you liked, but it, it gave you an understanding, a better understanding of physicians, of the hospital, and how that works, and and just moving forward. And I think it's important that people take on opportunities to either learn, like, this is more of something that I do like, this is something that I don't like. And there's both wins in, in both knowing that it's something that you do like or you don't like. And yeah. as you said, and you always have the opportunity to be able to speak to those experiences and interviews and all those different things as well. Did, did, you, did you do a lot of the same type of work for all these internships? Um... No, they're actually fairly different. Um, so I will say for the clinical internships, that mostly consisted of me shadowing the physicians and taking some of the clinical notes. And it was, like I said, more of an informative type of internship where I was able to understand what they were doing, understand what goes into a consultation with a patient. And just recognizing the different aspects of being a physician. So I did the, the NICU, that was one internship. And then um, the other one was I think in gastro and maybe general medicine or something like that. Um, so those ones, like I said, it was really um, just me supporting, supporting them in terms of just taking notes and um, doing what I could do or the most I could do without having medical degree. And I would say the nutrition ones were a little more hands-on where I was creating maybe educational materials, or I remember for one of their students, I had to create a nutrition plan because they were on a restrictive diet. So understanding how to do that. And I was also able to utilize what I had learned in my classes so far to create that dietary plan. So like I said, those neither of those things are, are what I'm doing right now, but they were helpful for me at the time to make sure that I was really utilizing my skills in the best way and also just figuring things out in terms of my likes and my dislikes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's, that's a great way to start off your career, um, especially when 
I feel like, especially in this health, healthcare, public health field, health mm-hmm. policy field is just so much in there. And like, we, we can never know all of that is in there. We might think that we like one thing over another until we actually get to try it and do it. Right. So take on all those opportunities and then learn more of what you like or what you don't like and try to build on those skill sets from there, I, I think is a, a key way to always think about it. For sure. And then uh, what, did you have any other takeaways during your time in undergrad? Hmm. I don't think I had, I had too many. Um, and I don't think I would have changed my undergrad experience either, even though it wasn't ideal, but it was really, really helpful to have some of those failures or some of the, at least what I thought was failures, which I now know they, they really weren't, but they helped me to understand what I wanted to do. It was like a each step was necessary to further understand what I wanted to do and to be where I am now. So I wouldn't have changed starting with biology and changing to nutrition. I wouldn't have changed doing those internships. I wouldn't have changed um, not knowing about public health in undergrad. So I think sometimes a lot of things they happen for a reason because you're maybe meant to learn about something a little bit later. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so you graduated from Penn State with your nutrition degree. Okay, so was the your next position was a senior clinical research coordinator at Massachusetts General Hospital. But you also said that you graduated and you did the MCAT twice. You got into a post-bac bachelorette program mm-hmm. and and then you didn't go, I'm guessing. I did not. Oh, <laughs> okay, so so was that before you got this position? Was this during your time you got this position? Tell, tell me about that. It was during during my time. So it was definitely really hard. I the MCAT, I don't know if you've ever taken a test. And as soon as you look at the questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was me when I took it the first time. I was like, I remember having the big, the big book, right? The big mm-hmm. book. I was flipping through it, highlights everywhere, uh, sticky notes everywhere. And I remember going into that test room, sitting down in my seat, and they were like, Yeah, um, you know, you can start whenever you're ready, clicking on the screen. And I said, <laughs> I said, maybe it's just the first question. So I'll go to the next one. No, it wasn't clicking. So I'm sitting here, I'm like, what am I gonna do for the next seven hours? <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that was that was a fail uh and then I said okay I need to do better or restructure my studying took it the second time it was a little better but still I was sitting there like is this necessary for me to know to really go to medical school um because all the physics forget about it like <laughs> physics was never my thing and never will be my thing Um, and just kind of those deeper sciences that maybe had more of a mathematical foundation. It wasn't never my strength. So, uh, yeah, took, took those two grueling exams and did not go to medical school. (laughs) Did not even apply to actual medical school. So, well, that, you saved yourself some stress in that as I well, because that, that's a whole other process of, of stress. And that, that's kind of like one of the reasons I, because I got into a master's of um, medical sciences program or one yep, year, like, those are the ones. <laughs> yeah. And, and I was like, ah, no, because I know I'm, I'm still going to have to retake the MCAT and then yeah. apply for medical school and still yep. it's not guaranteed. So it's like, right. ah, that's, that's, a, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of stress. But for anyone out there that is planning to take the MCAT, what I did learn from the two times that I did take it is definitely do a lot of practice questions because as Olivia said, those questions on the screen can look very, very foreign from like what you see in your textbook. The textbook and what's yeah. on, the, on the exam is two different things. Yeah. Two completely different things. Except from that. <laughs> okay so so how, how did you get your senior research uh senior clinical research coordinator position at mass general hospital that one i was just applying to to jobs probably a couple of months before i graduated from undergrad and it was it was rough finding finding a job after undergrad like if i knew what i knew now i don't think it would have been as rough for me but I didn't know. So I kind of just had to apply to job after job. I think I probably submitted like over 100 applications in that time. And finally, they 
or Mass General reached out to me for an interview and it was actually an Alzheimer's research, didn't have any experience in Alzheimer's research, but I did have a previous research position at Penn State. So that was helpful when it came to the interview, but for the most part, I would have really been starting from scratch in their research and what they were doing. But after I think like three interviews, they ended up picking me. So that was really great. And not just to have a job, but because I had the whole mass general hospital system as a resource, which was super amazing. And I would tell anybody, if you're in a hospital system or any type of organization that maybe has different departments or different people that you can speak to, definitely email those people and talk to them. Even if you're not interested or you don't know if you're interested, email them, talk to them, see what they're doing, because you might find something that you would prefer doing than what you're doing right now. So that was super helpful for me. And I definitely reached out to lots of different people in different departments, got involved in some obesity research and some health disparities research, and luckily had a few people that had enough belief in me to put me on their research paper. So I got a few publications when I was there too, which was a big plus for me. But yeah, my, my whole experience at, at Mass General was really awesome. And I don't think that I would have been here if it wasn't for those few years that I spent there. Okay, and that, that makes a lot of sense. You did say, um, looking, looking back now, if you knew what you knew now, um, you would have done things differently. And I'm gonna come back to that question. I'm also gonna come back to like, what did you do? Mm -hmm. so, so you were you were in this job and you said that you were thinking about going to the post-baccalaureate programs to, to pursue medical school, did mm -hmm. the MCAT twice. When did public health come into the picture? And what was that? What was that process like? Public health came into the picture when I was trying to figure out how I could do what I wanted without spending like 10 years in school. <laughs> Cause I said, I don't think I have it in me. To, to be quite frank, I did not have to, even people now ask me if I want to do a PhD. I'm like, you could do the PhD. <laughs> I'm not doing a PhD. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's that's when it came in and I just started again, utilizing the, the resource, which was Massachusetts General Hospital and talking to other people there who also had their MPH and just seeing what it was about because I would see a lot of people with MD, MPH. I'm like, okay, what's MPH? And I looked it up, Master of Public Health, did a little Google search, and I said, oh, this kind of sounds like something that I, that I want to do. And I knew that if I were to be a physician, that I really wanted to be like a community physician and work in a health clinic um, just to really meet people where they are, and then also to bring in my nutritional background to help bring in more like lifestyle solutions versus go directly into medication or any other type of procedure. Um, so I knew that's that's really what I what I wanted to do. And I was passionate about that, but I just didn't think that I was cut out for for the school. So just started reaching out to people who had their MPH and they talked to me about it. And the more people I talked to, the more I was like, okay, I think we are heading in the right direction in terms of getting to where I should be. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. And I don't wanna miss also the point of you saying that when you're in a big health system or like a big insurance company and things like that, there are so many people that work there in so many different departments mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> excuse me, and just having like the email address that you have and reaching out to people is, is a surefire way to connect and just have those conversations and get all those learnings and maybe learn about new things that you never knew were possible. So I think a lot of people might be in, in those health systems and, and just be sitting down in their position and not really being proactive in, in learning and seeing what else is out there. And I think that that is key. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad that you did that and uh, definitely found MPHs and, 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 and pursued from there. Um, okay, so coming back to your work as a clinical research coordinator, what, okay, actually you said, you said, you said something before I ask you what you did, you, um, you said that knowing what you know now, you would have done, I guess, applying or the process of getting a job a little differently. So tell me about that. Yeah, so what I meant about that, and it's really kind of the reason why I decided to start my business was 
the art of applying for jobs is a skill. It's not as easy, I think, as some people think it is. And when I was applying in undergrad, I still had some, some connections, but not really connections that really were strong. And I was applying through portals, uh, job application portals, which now it's like, unless I, unless I know somebody in the organization where they know I'm applying and they're like for protocol saying you have to apply through the portal, I usually do not apply through portals just because it can take a while for HR to get your application and it might not even get to the hiring manager. So the why I said if I knew what I knew now, I don't think I would have had a problem is because there were a few steps that I took to make sure that I was able to get a job after graduation. I've been in several different public health groups and I think the number one challenge for people has been either A, just finding a job or B, finding a job that pays well, or even C, finding a job that is directly related to their degree. And I looked at that every time I saw it, I said, it's not gonna be me. It's not gonna be me <laughs> every day. It's not gonna be me. <laughs> uh, and really just staying disciplined with that. And when I first got into my, my graduate program, I, had a plan and I would encourage everybody that when you're when you get into your graduate programs the the actual action of looking for a job does not start in your second year does not start in your last year doesn't even start in the first or in the last couple of months of your program it really should start at the beginning of your program and what I did was I knew I was coming to Washington DC I knew how many different public health organizations were in this area and I made it a point to connect with as many people as possible. And I always say that anything you wanna do well, you have to be disciplined. And it goes across any type of area or career field, even with sports. Like if you talk to some of the greatest in sports, you ask them, what do they do? Or how did they prepare to be as great as they are now? Their practice routines or their discipline strategy, you look at them like, that's a little, that's a little too much. But it's the same thing here. Like I would email like 10 to 15 people a day, um, just saying, hey, I'm a grad student. I want to know a little bit more about your doing, about what you're doing. And um I'm I'm new to this. So I would just like to talk to you about your job and what it looks like. Not even asking for like an internship or a job or anything, but making those connections were really key because when it did come time for me to get a job, it was like, I had all these other people that I already connected with and they knew my name, they knew my face, they basically knew my resume. So if I wanted to, I could reach out to them and ask them, are you hiring? And there would be a very solid chance that they would at least interview me and um, increase my chances with, with getting a job. So um, I would say the key difference between how I applied for jobs um, in my last year of grad school versus my senior year of college was the number and the quality of connections that I had within the space. And those are really, really key. Like you can look excellent on paper, you can look top tier on paper, but those connections are really, are what is, are gonna take you from point A to point B much quicker than just kind of foregoing those those connections and just kind of using your resume as as your currency. Yeah, I absolutely agree agree with that. And I, um, I think especially if you, as you said, like you move into DC and you know that you want to work in DC, you want to work in health policy. That's like, why not do that? And I, I think it's key to be proactive in in building out your network. And as you said, like if you're able to get that warm handoff. The, you're you're gonna get more interviews. You're gonna get more opportunities. You're gonna they're gonna let you know of other things that are happening, and and that's just all good things that that go towards you for being proactive. And like for me, I started looking for jobs like a year before I graduated from my MPH as well, and got a little bit obsessive. But you know it, it's helped me a lot, and I I see a lot of my my cohort members who couldn't get jobs like months after they graduated and things like that because. 
I don't know if they were just focusing on school or just weren't thinking about the job market or, or all those different kinds of things. But I think it's so important. Like you're going to school to get a job at some point in time, unless you're going on into academia. Um, so so be sure to to be proactive and and look up look for those networking opportunities. And and another thing, like LinkedIn just recently oh, yes. opened up a feature where you could um have LinkedIn, it either integrates to Zoom, Microsoft Teams, or LinkedIn has their own video platform now where you can send meetings on LinkedIn, which I think is a, awesome. a, ga yeah, it's a game changer. Like I, yeah. I recently scheduled a meeting with someone in, Tha in Thailand and I was like, wow, this is awesome. I don't have to email them. It just cut down the process so, so much. So I think like LinkedIn is going to be a huge resource for yeah. students with the informational interviews. And because I think it's a great resource, like and then apart from that, also use your email and get on get online and just start emailing people and looking for ways to, to get in there. And I think everything you said, completely, completely agree. Okay, before before we forget where we are, um, <laughs> well, what did you do in, in this in this role as a clinical as a clinical research coordinator, mm -hmm. senior clinical research coordinator? <laughs> So my role, like I said, was involved in Alzheimer's research, and I met with a lot of patients that did have Alzheimer's or they did have some sort of memory loss. And even though sometimes it was it was sad seeing them, I really enjoyed getting just those small moments with them because you would see families that come in with their significant other or their family member and kind of be in the early stages in terms of denying that they have a memory loss. And oftentimes I would see people that would repeat the same story over and over and over again. And I never minded just reacting in the same way. I was like, I'm only with them for an hour or two hours. I can, I can say, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> Every time they tell me the same story, you know, like, what is that going to do? It's not going to hurt me. So, um, and I could tell, even though the person knew they had memory loss, it's like just having somebody that allowed them to just be, because sometimes uh, in Alzheimer's space for family members, it's, it's really difficult. And I would see people saying like, honey, you already said that, like, you already told her that. And I would be like, it's okay. You know, they, they can, they can tell me I'll, I'll be here. You know, you can tell me the story 20 times if you want, don't, it don't matter to me, but I'll still be here and listen. So um, outside of just meeting with them, I would be responsible for giving neuropsych testing. So um, there's something called the MOCA, which um, I think, I think both uh, former president Trump and Biden had to take those tests um and it's a a test that kind of take like test your base uh brain function so it's like i think i think i remember it's out of 30 so if you got like a score of below 24 then it's like this is some cause for concern um but just administering those tests and uh drawing blood which is going to sound weird but drawing blood was kind of fun because uh I love challenges and some everybody's veins are not the same. So taking, taking blood sometimes um, poses, uh, sometimes difficult, but it was, it was interesting. Um, but yeah, other than that, it was, you know, basic and boring data entry stuff, but I still appreciated the time that I got to actually make connections with, with people and all the stories that I could hear because on, on average, I think the ages were like 75 and older. So they would come in with all these super fun stories. And I'm like, wow, this is what I get to do for work. I get to come in and, and sit and talk to people, which, which was always so fun. So um, yeah, and, and that, that position just gave me a really strong foundation in research, which even though I'm not in research now, it was very helpful in terms of learning how to one right or understanding research writing and then being able to translate it into policy writing okay all right awesome and yeah um i definitely appreciate the work you've done with alzheimer's patients uh, i don't think i've ever mentioned it on the podcast but my, my grandfather had, had alzheimer's before he passed and I, I could I could understand why people could get like irritated by getting yeah. asked the same question over and over and over. But as you said, like your job is is there and you're only with them for like 
two hours or so. Because I know my grandfather used to ask me, um, how's school going? Like 20 times. And yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was quite quite interesting. But hopefully, hopefully there, there is a, a cure or something to slow down Alzheimer's coming in, in the near future with all, all our health advancements as well. Because it, it is really a, a sad, sad disease in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, they're and they're working hard. So hopefully, hopefully soon we'll have something. Yeah, absolutely. And then you, I don't know if I if I wrote this down from someone else or from you, but you got a shift or promotion to community organizer in in. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm the type of person that I do multiple things at the same time. So I it's a running joke that like, I cannot just stick with having one job. So I will usually have two and I have two now because I'm a manager and I'm also a founder and CEO of my business. So at that time, again, was utilizing the resource of the hospital and trying to find a position that aligned more with what I wanted to do with public health. So I found the community organizer position, which ironically, was run in a center by a researcher that was originally in my department, but we never did any work together. So seeing a familiar name when it came to the application, he was like, oh, I remember seeing you around the office and told him what I wanted to do with the position and I got, I got hired for it. So I ended up doing both the clinical research um, position and the community organizer position at Mass General. Um, I will say it was a little bumpy with HR because they were trying to tell me that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do two at once because um, I couldn't handle it. And I was like, you guys, you guys don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I said, if, I, if I ever give you a reason to believe that I cannot handle this, if you ever see my work slacking, or if you ever see me just like not producing what I need to produce, then come talk to me and yeah. But I said, it's not going to happen because I know, I know how to balance, balance my things well. So that position, uh, I really enjoyed it just because I had like free reign in it in terms of what events I could bring to the community, how I wanted to have the events and just bringing less stuffy events to, to Boston. Cause sometimes when you have Mass General on the flyer, it's like very, like we're talking at you type of thing. Like uh, and we're giving you this information, which is good because there's still a very necessary to have health education in the community, but I noticed that for a lot of the events, there wasn't that opportunity for people to really have discussions in either discussions between other attendees or discussions between the, the hosts. So one event that I created was mental health in the black community. And for me, I really wanted to, I really wanted to present an event that was going to be beneficial for the community. I remember so many people told me like, you might not have too many people come out to this because mental health is still a big stigma in the black community. Once again, I was like, you don't know me. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know me. <laughs> so uh, again, like I said before, I love challenges. And, and anytime anybody tells me no, or anybody tells me I can't do something, it's even more of a driver for me to, to get that something done. So I was determined to make sure that I was getting this event to any and everybody in the city. And we ended up uh, filling the, the room that was rented to capacity. And there was even like overflow. And I remember telling my, my supervisor at the time, like, I think we need a bigger room. And they were like, no, you know, I think I think we'll be fine. I'm like, I we need a bigger, a bigger room. They said, we'll we'll see how it is when we when we get there. I said, all right. When you when you find people that are standing on the stairs, don't don't come to me. <laughs> and we found people standing on the stairs on the day of the event, and um, and it was it was really great because I was able to recruit several physicians um, that worked in psychiatry to come and talk and really give the community an opportunity to ask questions to doctors that are in the city that look like them. 
And just also, um, I think it was helpful for one of the physicians to talk about um, how faith can also be used as um, like a support when it comes to mental health and maybe not necessarily something that is used to like completely um, handle it, but to incorporate that into your mental health journey when it comes to healing. And I think that that really resonated a lot with the people that were in the event, but that was just one of a couple of events that I was able to throw. And it was what I ended up writing my personal statement about when it came to applying to my, my MPH program. So it was a double plus for me to be in, in, in that position. Yeah, and I was just about to say like that, that's so public health of you um, to, to go in there because I know like a lot of these health systems, they are very institutional in their ways and it's very top top down approach and not bottom up, not listening to community, not having, like I just said, just having a way to dialogue with people there as well as having the health system dialogue with community to really get those community uh, driven solutions. I know that that has been changing in um recent times hopefully it changes to a great extent um if it will i don't know that <laughs> I'm, I'm a little skeptical but here, here we are and, and i'm glad that that you got to do that work that's awesome and yeah um if, if no balance or like if a lot and I, I know some people are just like programmed to do more than others some people just feel more comfortable or some people they need to be doing a couple different things to just feel like they, they're okay and they're not like just lying around doing nothing so i, I think that's, that's fine me. yeah like if, that's if, if, and i feel like that comes with all with like self-reflection and knowing yeah. yourself and and okay this is like doing this much is good for me it might be too much for them and they might they might see it as an issue or yeah or, or they might like reflect that oh i'm i would burn out if i was in your position so you should be burning out but like everyone is different so know yourself and uh reflect yeah. and and build off of that as well and, and then before we, we go to your Masters of Public Health, you had an outreach coordinator at Partners for Youth with Disabilities. Uh, why don't you just touch on, on how you got that and then a little bit about what you did on that? Sure. So um, that one was actually, it was a position recommended to me by one of my coworkers in my, when I was a clinical research coordinator. So she was applying to be a mentor in that program, but she also knew that I was looking for a part-time job just to get some extra cash. And she was like, oh, they're hiring for this person. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll apply. And that was, I was doing remote remote work before, before COVID. So it, that job worked out perfectly for me because I was still able to do, and now that I talk about it, I'm like, some of the things I do, I'm like, how, how am I balancing all this? But uh, I think it's just in me to be doing a bunch of things at once. So I was doing the, I was a clinical research coordinator, I was a community organizer, and I was the outreach coordinator all at the same time. Um, but I think for me, I get some sort of peace by having to kind of force myself to prioritize things. Um, and sometimes having too much free time causes me to uh, procrastinate. So it, in a weird way, it's helpful for me to not procrastinate when I actually have to be mindful of my schedule. So in that position, I was responsible for recruiting Boston-based businesses to either host job shadows or give guest lectures to students with disabilities in Boston public schools. So that was actually a pretty cool job to have just because, again, I felt like I was contributing to um, something positive where students were getting exposed to different types of jobs and just not the typical uh, route when it comes to school. Like I think still now for the most part is you go to high school, you go to college, and then you do whatever you want after, but exposing them to different routes. You could go to trade school, you could just get an internship first and then transition into a full-time job when you graduate. And it was just really cool because lots of the students, they had interests and I was given those lists of interests and I had to find different organizations that aligned with those interests. And it was awesome when I got to see videos of the students so excited to hear about something that they had been passionate about. So even though it wasn't necessarily public health focused, it was still helpful because I had 
I think a closer understanding of um, the needs of, of students and especially students with disabilities. And I think um, their needs and, and their careers are often overlooked and it felt nice to, to contribute to that. And I do hope that, that some of them ended up doing, doing all the things that, that they loved and were able to connect with those businesses that, that I brought to the organization. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and I think like exposure is so, so important. Like if you can't get experience, get exposure, and then you, you'll get that experience afterward. Because yeah, I think a lot of us just live in, a, in an environment that is usually like not fostering new thoughts or we're not seeing new things. And, and I think that exposure is just so important to like personal growth, professional growth as well. So, yeah. so I'm glad that you can do that. And yeah, definitely as a population that is very, very overlooked. So, so good job on, on doing that work. And I'm glad that you didn't burn out from those three different roles that you had at the same time. Surprisingly, I, I did it. <laughs> very weird. I don't know. That's just how I'm wired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So then you went on and got your Master's of Public Health at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. Tell me about the thought process for applying there. I actually, George Washington was my number one school. And before applying, I always knew I wanted to move to the DC area. And I said, if I don't end up getting into my MPH program this year, I'm going to move to DC anyways. So I applied. I was originally going to apply to like 16 different programs and submit it right. <laughs> what kind of money did I think I had? I don't know, but long story short, I did not apply to those 16 different programs. I ended up applying to just three and George Washington was my first acceptance. And I sat and I was like, is it necessary to apply to the rest of them? George Washington was my number one but I had chosen George Washington because they were the only program that had a community oriented primary care concentration, which I was like, oh my gosh, community oriented primary care. And it just really touched on the fact or my, my passion originally for wanting to be a physician, a physician in primary care and then adding in that community aspect. So I said, so you mean to tell me I could do this in two years and, and be doing the work that I want to be doing? I said, sign me up. <laughs> so um, that, was, that was really the, the main reason. And again, my community organizer position, I think was really a game changer for me because I was able to directly align that with the program objectives and really be able to say, this is why I want to do this. Like, I want to continue doing the work that I was already doing. So again, life has a lot of plot twists. I came into the program, the classes were great. Um, but then I took a health policy class. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, are we having another change now? Because I'm tired. This is, this is, this is a lot of different changes, but um, I was like, oh, okay, and I started to learn a bit about how legislation is introduced at the state and federal level, and even at the, at the local level, and how policies are created and how they affect the community. I said, this actually might be where I need to be. And then also a more important aspect was, even though I love community work, when it came to being realistic about what type of job I wanted, I needed to have something with a little bit of money because DC is not a cheap city to live in. So I started looking at the community positions that were open just to get an idea of what kind of salary I would be looking at. And they weren't matching up with the cost of living here. So I started looking at health policy positions. I said, oh, okay. These, these are a, a bit better. These will allow me to actually live my life without, uh, without eating ramen noodles every day. <laughs> um, so I took that one class and from there, of course I finished the rest of my community oriented primary care courses, but every elective after that was a health policy class. And I will say big, big shout out to George Washington University's health policy department. Um, this is not to say the prevention and community health department isn't also star studded, but the health policy department 
really, really prepared me for my career in health policy. And the professors have been professors that have worked on Capitol Hill. They've worked with different members of Congress. They've been advisors, policy advisors to different US presidents. And they just had the level of insight that I don't think somebody would be able to get at a different university. And this is going back to saying, really utilize the resources that you have within the school. I made my rounds in that health policy department. Everybody, everybody in my face, I was like, you have to tell me a little bit more about what this is. Like, I have no idea about what health policy is, but I think I want to get into it. And I went in, I said, I have no experience, but I, but I want to start. And professors gave me different advice. They said, you can start by reaching out to people, get an internship, figure out what, what it is that you want to focus on. And then from there, um, you, you'll kind of find your way. And I know that's kind of vague advice, but for me, it really, it really kind of was a catalyst when it came to reaching out to different people on LinkedIn, different people who are in health policy analyst positions or their health policy advisor on the Hill or any other type of health policy related positions, I was messaging them just saying, if you have 15, 20 minutes, I would love to hear about what you do at your job because I'm trying to figure out what I wanna do. And I never had anybody that responded to me that said they didn't wanna to talk to me. So um, I think for the most part, people are really willing because they remember when they were in that position and most people are willing to take 15, 20 minutes to talk to you about what they do and if it can be helpful in terms of you narrowing down what you wanna do. I think most people are, are very open, but yeah, I, I think George Washington's health policy department, big, big, big factor in, in where I am right now because they prepared me in a way that I could not have prepared myself. And it feels like I've been in health policy for a couple of years, but I only just started last year. <laughs> so, and, and they were really a, a, a big part in that in terms of my understanding and developing my skills, especially when it comes to writing. Big, big thing for health policy is, is knowing how to, how to write. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I would say that um, GW was, was excellent in, in training me and getting me ready for the real world and for the career that I wanted. Okay, well, kudos, kudos to GW for that. And I definitely think that they, they're one of the better, if not best schools to, to go around and do policy work. Um, yeah, that definitely. I want to say I applied and got into there as well with a, it was the online program. Um, but yeah, that, that that's that's great. And I'm, I'm glad. And I also want to say like, you went in there, you found this concentration that was that was uh, similar to what you saw as like a physician, but more like community oriented. And you did that. And then you learned about health policy. And then you were able to take electives that align with health policy, which I think is how the MPH is kind of set up. So like, even if you go into a concentration and you're like, oh, and, and I know a lot of the schools, you cannot change concentrations, um, but the electives are just such a big part of, of that and of your of everything that you're learning, as well as you said, all the resources that you had, they're reaching out to the professors and asking them what to do. And then just being in DC as in yeah. general is, is probably a, a great, great way to start. So, so tell me broadly, so like you, you didn't know what health policy was going into your MPH. Now you work in health policy. What would be like a, a discreet or quick way to, to say what health policy is? Um, well, health policy, I would say, is just the practice of making health better, but in writing, if that makes, if that makes sense. But um, policy is just a lot of written, written documents. Of course, it's discussed among groups of people, but it's that written Dot or those written documents that really impact how health looks. So for example, I'll use a DC like Ward 7 and 8 here. I was doing some research around their, their policies on food insecurity. And this is, I think, common among um, 
lots of different cities where you have a particular population that has worse health outcomes than the other. And that usually is either Afri African-American or Latinos that have worse health outcomes than um, their white counterparts. So looking at that, you look at what access they have to food and you look at the grocery stores, you look at um, kind of what the, the city looks like. And for DC, they had a policy that was called, I think, Feed DC, where they were trying to incentivize, incentivize grocery stores to come to Ward 7 and 8, set up their stores so that residents would have more access to whole foods, fresh foods, and so that they could better their, their health outcomes. So having a policy like that, um, yes, you can have farmers markets and um, maybe teach people how to, how to grow things in a, in a garden, but those types of policies where you have money behind it and you have something in writing that's almost like a contract between the city and uh, potential grocers, those I think can indirectly impact health outcomes. So that's kind of how I would describe health policy. It's even though it's it's not something that is is talked about much because sometimes it can be a little stuffy when you're talking about it, but it has such a big part to do with health outcomes in general. And I think again, health policy can be often overlooked um, when it comes to really how much it does affect um, health outcomes. Yeah, and I, and I think like when we look at it broadly speaking, health policy and all, all the different systems that have been set up with the different health policies are the drivers of a lot of our, of our social determinants of health and, and the different ways that we approach that. So I, I do believe that it is, and it's like a, a large impact. It's like not, not community work, but it's like up here, that's going to trickle down and, right. and affect everything underneath it. And hopefully in, in a positive way, um, yeah. not, not always. And I think like that, that's one thing that we always have to think about is like, the unintended consequences of things that we do. And then especially when you're dealing with these big complex systems and big complex policies, like a lot of things don't always happen the way that you do. But I think that it is important to have these kinds of policies and really have them driven by like community need and social determinants of health and, and all those different types of um, factors that, that go into people's living. Okay, so your first position while you were in your MPH was a nutrition fellow at Women's Advancing Women, Women Advancing Nutrition, Dietetics, and Agriculture. So tell me how do you get that and what do you do in it? Uh, that one I got by networking. Uh, I had reached out, so it's a long name, but it's it's known as Wanda, and I had reached out to the CEO Tambra and just told her, hey, I'm trying to get some more experience with public health because the community organizer position was really my only direct or directly related position to public health. And I said, I'm trying to build my resume, but also figure out what other things I would like to do. So within that position, I was able to attend a DC had like an NBC health conference where we had a table and everything and we were kind of um, telling other people about Wanda and um, the purpose of it. And the purpose of Wanda was really to promote nutrition, but also promote it in a way that um, allows people to stick with their cultural roots. So it was a lot of Caribbean influence, a lot of African influence, a lot of American influence, and just understanding that just because just because there are some foods that are healthy doesn't mean that you need to completely like wipe away who you are. Like for example, I'll say for Nigerian food, we have fufu, which if you eat too much of it, you might start ended up looking like what fufu looks like. <laughs> but it's like, you don't have to stop eating that meal. You can replace it with something. Some people replace it with plantain. Some people place replace it with oatmeal or something that maybe has less carbs and is less heavy. So really promoting that kind of modification of some of those cultural foods, but just sticking to who you are and not having to force yourself to change your palate to maybe fit what is known as in what is known like in mainstream as healthy. 
So um, that was really, or that is really an organization that prides itself in, in that, and which was a reason why I was very interested. But towards the end of the, the fellowship, I was able to co-host some COVID series. And we talked about food access in COVID. That was during a time where everybody was taking the toilet paper and there was no food left on the shelves and everything. So we were like, okay, there's no food left in the grocery store. Like, what do you do? And we had people come in and talk about growing your own food and um, also just trying to also pick out um, healthier food options in the grocery stores with what you have and also just getting active. And we had a talk, I think also about mental health. So um, that was a really cool fellowship. I got to learn a bunch of different things and also get more oriented with DC and um, excuse me, and, and the history of the city too. Okay, wow, that's awesome. And then you also had another fellowship as a health policy fellow at the Association of Maternal and Child Health Program. So how do you get that one? And then what do you do? That one, I, so this is also something I tell people to do. Looking back, I looked at the, the description of it and I was like, I'm probably not as qualified as they want somebody to be, but I said, if I get an interview, I can I, I can I can do this. Um, and I was maybe like had like six or seven out of let's say 10 things that they wanted. But I said, this is a fellowship that would really help me in terms of advancing my career and strengthening my understanding of health policy. So if I get an interview, that's going to be one of my talking points where it's like, I may not have the experience that you are asking for. But I am here to learn, and these are the skills that I can bring to you to further advance the priorities that you have. So what I did was I saw the posting, and you know how on LinkedIn, it will tell you how many people have applied to a position? There was too many. So I said, let me find this woman's email because my, my, <laughs> my application is not going to make it through the portal. So I ended up emailing her, and I said... I am interested in this fellowship and I, I really think that it would benefit me, but I can also benefit your team. So this is my resume. I'm happy to apply through the portal just for HR's sake, but I just wanted to reach out personally to let you know that I'm interested in. And she got back to me, I think same day or next day, she said, thank you so much for sending because I wasn't looking at any more applications in the portal. <laughs> So um, they ended up setting, uh, setting up an interview with me. And in the interview, I said what I just said here. I said, listen, I'm really trying to get into health policy. And I've taken these classes, I'm at least academically trained in this. But I want that practical, hands-on, real-life experience when it comes to health policy. And this is how I can, I can assist you or support your team in doing that. So I would say this to say to other people, don't only apply to jobs that you are like 10 out of 10 qualified. And when it comes to, um, when it comes to just having success in your career, I think it has a lot to do with how you feel about yourself. Like when you apply to something, are you feeling confident in your application or are you feeling like, Mm, like, I don't, I don't know if they would, if they would pick me, like, I knew that I didn't have all of the qualifications they wanted, but I was confident that I could make a difference on their team. And I think how you think about yourself really, really affects how other people view you. So if you are a confident individual, even if you, nobody knows everything there is to know in the world, but if you are confident and you also create space for learning for yourself, people will be like, okay, this person is coachable. Um, and, and that's a big thing too, is presenting yourself as coachable. You never wanna go into something with a, I know it all type of attitude, but you also don't wanna go into something timid or not being sure of your skills or your ability to impact a team. So I think that for me, that was a, a big thing when it came to me applying for, for different jobs is, just knowing like, hey, I might not be 100% qualified, but I know if they pick me, it will be a positive, a positive impact on their team. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing I wanted to add in there, like 
Well, it's awesome that you reached out to the HR manager separately, and she's like, "Thank God, because I'm tired. I'm tired of looking at that portal." <laughs> and you were able to finesse your your application into there. But another thing that students, public health professions, could look at is a lot of the times on LinkedIn, there's usually the HR manager on not usually, but most of the time on on the job posting, and could literally yeah. just just message them, ask them more about the job and different things like that. Or you can do that informal, um, reaching out and sending the application that way as well. So just to add that in there as well. So, but yeah, that's awesome that you're able to get this and finesse it. And and as I think is is very important, especially as students. A lot of the times, we are going to have like the theor- theoretical knowledge and not really the mm-hmm. actual knowledge. But just showing that you do have value to bring and you have skill sets that can support the team is so important. And also like the confidence in your abilities to do that is I think is hugely important as well so yeah. what, what type of stuff did, did you do in, in this uh, fellowship so there I did a lot of definitely attending different events and it was great for me because it allowed me to have kind of a real life foundation when it came to health policy like I already had the academic training of it but I needed to get more hands-on experience so those events allowed me to figure out how health policy works. So it was still during during COVID and I attended lots of hearings on the Hill and I got to see how those work and how testimonies work and how those hearings can possibly impact legislation. Also had the opportunity to meet with a few people on the Hill as as it relates to uh, maternal health and um, was really involved in a lot of advocacy work in the in the organization. And again, using my uh, my graphic design skills, I think is something that has been used in like almost every position now. And it's also kind of goes to to show like if you understand what your skills, what your skill set is, and you know how to kind of craft it or market it, people people will come to you about it if you know how to market it well. So um, did a lot of a lot of work for for the organization in terms of just making documents look nice, um, presenting information in a way that was easily digestible, but also was um, aesthetically pleasing to look at. Uh, and yeah, just understanding uh, maternal health in the federal landscape and what was going on, um, which was really great because again, before the position, I really wasn't knowledgeable about it at all, but um, I just had to look up a lot of different legislation, just see what um, other people were doing and and keep track of um, the different policies that were being discussed either on the Hill or just among different maternal and child health organizations. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. And as you said, like you got in there and you were able to get all these experiences that were very, that are gonna be very beneficial to, to your later career uh, trajectory. So I have here that you either got shifted or promoted into a manager policy and government affairs at the uh, Association of Maternal and Child Health Program. So was it a shift or a promotion? It was a promotion. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> tell, tell, tell me more about that. <laughs> uh, so I would say the the promotion, it um, even though it was like a legit promotion, it wasn't a shift in in the work that I was doing. I was still doing the same the same things that I was doing before. And um, for me, I started to hit a, a plateau in terms of my my learning and the the challenge of the position. And um, I would say my, my coworkers there were great. Um, they were really nice and, and accommodating and everything. But um, for me, I knew it was time to find something, something different and something that was a little more challenging and maybe align better with what I wanted to do. Um, so I ended up finding the position that I'm in now. And one of my friends sent me the position actually. And, um, they were like, Hey, take a look at this. See if you, if you like it. And I found, um, the federal affairs manager position. And once again, shout out to LinkedIn because my now supervisor, I was connected with him and I just sent him a message asking, Hey, are you still hiring for, for this position? 
And he said, um, we already started interviews, but if you're still interested, put my name down on your application and like get your application in ASAP. So um, once again, utilize your network. Like I, I don't think, I mean, maybe I would still gotten an interview, but I don't know if I would have really gotten a job if I didn't take that first step in introducing myself before I even applied. So um, that was a, a great pivot for me because the organization now we do some work on maternal health, but it's like an all encompassing, like you get to touch on every time, kind of topic there is. And that was great for me. It's like every day I'm learning something new. It's, it's challenging, but in a good way and it keeps my mind working. And for me, that's important to be in a job where I'm using, I'm using my brain. I have to think, I have to think critically and I just have to, um, just figure things out. Um, and I think that's that's a big part of growing for me. And I never wanna stop growing. And if I feel like my growth has been stunted or it's, it's just stopped, then that's when I talk to myself. I'm like, okay, maybe it's time to try something different. Yeah, I, I, like, I like that a lot. And I think a lot of us do get stuck in like complacency or, or different things like that. And we don't reflect and look back and say, okay, what is it that I need more of or what is that case? And, and I think having that kind of growth mindset built in is, is always a, a benefit in, in your career and life just in general. Yeah. And then you had a lot, your, your last position, at least that I have written down here, junior MPH as a graduate research assistant at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And this is also your practicum. So tell, yeah. tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so that one was not in... Alzheimer's. Actually, sorry. No, it was. Um, the reason why I'm blanking is because uh, COVID ended up just messing a lot of things up, and um, I'm not I'm not sure where the study is now. But it was a study focused on Black male caregivers of um, family members, I think, with Alzheimer's or dementia. So I had seen a lot of studies on the actual patient with Alzheimer's or dementia, but not too many on the caregivers and their stress levels and maybe how that contributes to health outcomes for them. And I was interested in this as a practicum just because I had already had a position focusing on the patient side. And I was interested to see what research would come about with the caregiver side. So um, that also gave me an opportunity to network within the city and recruit different community organizations that could possibly help with recruiting research participants and also um, in the future maybe even being hosts for kind of like health education seminars or something that the community can come to and learn a little bit more about Alzheimer's and dementia and for caregivers to learn about support groups that are available. So um, for that one, I was um, mostly responsible for making those community connections and for handling that. But again, graphic design coming in, I created the research study flyer that they had and also um, uh, recruitment strategies that, that could be used for um, research participants. But it was fairly short, I would say from January to... April-ish, yeah, January to like early April. Um, and it was April that everything kind of shifted to remote of last year. So uh, so yeah, overall, I mean, um, it was nice to kind of get a different perspective on Alzheimer's disease and also to connect with different organizations in the area that were focusing on Alzheimer's and dementia. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. And then I, I didn't forget, you you did say that, well, obviously through the conversation just now, you said that the first half of your MPH was like in person, the second half was online. So tell me a little bit about more, more of that and how, how that like affected you at all, if, if it did. It was rough. Um, that's, that's, that's the only way I can, I can really explain it because 
it went from kind of having the opportunity to break up your day to kind of everything being consolidated into one because I just started working full time in the summer last year or started working full time again in the summer of last year, but I was also taking summer classes. So working from home with work and then after work having two to three hour classes in the evening and just being at the same place for the whole day and not really having that, oh, I need to drive from here to here, or I need to walk from here to here and not having that breakup. It, it was really, it was really tough. And for me, my, my usual stress relief relievers, um, I'm a volleyball player and I couldn't play volleyball. So I'm like, oh, okay, what am I going to do? And um, just ended up doing some walks and stuff just to try and break up the day. But um, it was definitely difficult when it came time to learn epi. Um, my epi class was <sighs> shout out to my professor there because <laughs> I was like, this is this is this is hard for me. Anything that's math related or like stats or anything with numbers or that has to do with um, learning how to uh, do like analysis with numbers or with equations that part of my brain, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't work that well. So um, I had a wonderful professor that really took time with me. And he, after class, he would spend like another hour, hour and a half with me going through SBSS and step-by-step -step just walking me through how to do this and maybe correcting some of my mistakes. And once again, I'm like, after a three hour class and you're sitting here spending another hour with me and I'm not the only student, you might have another student that you're talking to after was one of the reasons why I, I give GW a big, a big shout out. But yeah, um, I definitely struggled though uh, in terms of concentrating with, with classes. And I remember one of, my, one of my health policy professors, I wrote something and you could just tell I wasn't trying to write it. <laughs> um, and I submitted it just for the sake of submitting it and saying that I turned the assignment in on time. But she emailed me back. She was like, let's set up a time to chat because I don't think, she was like, I've never seen your work before, but I don't think that this is the type of work that you are really capable of, of doing. So um, that one-on-one -on -one connection and just compassion that was given by professors in the time was really appreciated because it was just having that understanding of we're all going through a rough time. Like I'm trying to navigate this as a professor, you're trying to navigate this as a student, let's figure out how we can work together and, and make sure that you are getting what you need out of this class and you're getting the support that you needed. So um, yeah, once again, I am very happy that school is done because it was, it was it was not easy making that transition from from in person to to remote, but I think for everybody who did that, it definitely built a little bit of character. Yeah, I, I could only could only imagine, and kudos to you for getting through. And shout out to that that professor for for giving you that time. And, and I feel like that's also insights. Like if if you are struggling, like reach out. You never know if the professor is yeah. willing to give you that extra time and extra support to really help you get through the the, the project or the class, I should say. So yeah, awesome. Were there any other takeaways from your MPH that you wanted to share? I would say that anybody who is currently uh, an MPH student or even just a grad student in general, do not be afraid to contact your professors or any other of the faculty in the school. Um, for GW, I think that's one thing that they said, they were like, students don't really reach out to us as much as they should. and. I would say you can save yourself so much time and trouble by just contacting them and and asking them for help. <laughs> There's no, it's not, it's not wrong to ask them for help. It's not wrong to ask them for guidance. That's part of the reason why they're there. So don't be afraid to, to send that email and reach out, even if you if you don't word it correctly, just you putting forth the effort to reach out. And also just making sure that you have kind of a little bit of knowledge of what you want to speak about. Like, don't send an email saying, hey, can I talk to you? Uh, 
but being more specific, hey, uh, could we set up a time to discuss maybe my career or some options after graduation and just getting a little bit more specific or as specific as you can, but don't don't be afraid to, to reach out to them because that might be your kine, your kine, <laughs> that might be your key to um, getting a, a position after you graduate and it could lead to a bunch of different connections. So um, I would say absolutely, again, utilize all the resources that are given to you within school and also um, network with your fellow students too. That's a big key. I think a lot of times there's a focus on networking up but also make sure to network across because your classmate also may be the key to you getting a job that maybe you wouldn't have gotten if you didn't have that inside connection. Yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's, it's your money going to pay the professors. So you should definitely take advantage of it. 100%. <laughs> awesome. Um, so you graduated and did you graduate? Did you start your manager job or did you start your consulting business first? Uh, like my current position now? Yeah, which which of the current positions now did, did you start first? I started my manager job first before I started my business. Okay, well, tell me about how you got that after graduating with your MPH and then what do you do in it? So my manager job, uh, like I said earlier, I had reached out to um, my now uh, supervisor on LinkedIn and just asked if they were still opening or if they're still interviewing for for the job and he said yes and it was maybe like a week turnaround time and they they offered me the job so I was super excited um, because not only was it um, just a lot more challenging like I said in a good way um, it was also a significant salary increase so I was really excited about that um, but what I do is is kind of it's kind of hard to explain, but I am a federal affairs manager, and I do a lot of work as it relates to uh, Capitol Hill, but also with different federal agencies, specifically the Centers for um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services (CMS), and um, we speak with them mainly the organization we um, we focus on healthcare quality measures and those measures are really in place to improve the current healthcare system and healthcare delivery um, so we have these discussions with federal agencies with different congressional offices one to get people to understand what quality measures are but on the CMS side, we have those discussions to align with what they're doing. And a lot of the focus is on equity as it has been with different organizations. I think the pandemic has kind of pushed people to prioritize health equity a bit more and social determinants of health. And even now I'm working on a response to a request for information from Congress. They have now a social determinants of health caucus and they had a bunch of questions for people to answer about social determinants of health. And I will be submitting a response um, on behalf of the organization with uh, my director, of course, but um, those are the type of things that we are responsible for doing in, in the job and really making those connections on the Hill and just with other organizations that may align with what we're doing and organizations that have centered health equity in their work and basically anybody else that would be a good person to connect with. So I do a lot of things. I'm still trying to even figure out what, like, like what everything is. And that's another reason why I love this job because there's something new every day, which is like one of the main reasons why I was interested in it. But um, so far it's been really great. I've got to meet a lot of great people and got to learn a lot more about what's going on at the federal level and also what different organizations are doing when it comes to advancing health equity. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm glad that you're able to learn uh, a bunch of different things. And like for me, myself, I find it very hard to explain what I do. And I think it's, it's also because I do like a lot of different things and yeah. I don't know like what to lead with, you know, so so, so I completely understand that. And uh, kudos for you for getting that uh, manager job after your MPH as well, because I know that that is also a difficulty for a lot of people um, 
coming out of the MPH and wanting to get into those kind of positions. It's mm-hmm. not an easy thing to do. So so kudos for you on, on that. You. So you're also the CEO and founder of Live Consulting and Career Services, where you support public health students as well as aspiring and current public health professionals, including will help with like including resumes, job prep, interview prep, graphic design, and like everything else in between. Uh, so so tell tell me what what was the the driving process that that made you want to start this uh, consulting business? For that, before I launched my business, I was already helping friends or even just random people that would reach out to me for help with their resume or with their personal statements. Over the years, I've definitely become a strong writer and I've been able to help people with that. And I think at one point I was helping somebody with their personal statement and I was like, this is kind of a lot of work. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is a lot of work, <laughs> um, but I was I was absolutely happy to do it um, just because I remember having people that did that for me and it was more of a, I'm, I want to pay it forward type of thing. So I remember thinking that I, I knew that I wanted to start a business, a consulting business, but I was like, I'll just, I'll just wait until I'm 30 and I'm 27 now. And I remember speaking with my friends and family. They were like, why wait? And for me, I'm like, well, by the time I'm 30, I'll be a little bit more accomplished and more qualified and people will take me more seriously. And my people, they were like, people take you seriously now. I was like, really? (laughs) So (laughs) I said, okay, I'll just go, I'll go ahead and and, and start it. But um, it has been quite a journey. And the main reason I wanted to launch this was because I wanted to, be able to help in a more structured way in terms of helping public health students and professionals navigate the career field and to be able to maximize their success when it comes to public health. So understanding that the way that I think about things is not the same way that other people think about things and trying to kind of craft that thinking into a way that would make more sense to somebody else. So I offer like personalized, personalized like networking strategies or career strategies that would fit each individual. Like for me, I know that not every person wants to be emailing 10 to 15 people a day. So understanding what's comfortable for somebody, are you more comfortable with sending an email or talking on the phone with somebody? Understanding who you are as a person is important and also understanding your weaknesses. I think a lot of times when people are in graduate programs, they think automatically when they graduate, this MPH, this is my ticket. And I will automatically get a job because I have an MPH and that's not how it works. Because one, there's a lot of people out there with an MPH, but you have to figure out what makes you different from everybody else that has an MPH. And that part, I think, is the part that is not really taught in the programs, and it's what people are missing. I've spoken with a lot of people that they look excellent on paper. I'm like, wow, like, this is all great experience. This, you did this, you did this. And then we'll do a mock interview. And I said, so let me, let me talk to you for a second. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me talk to you first. <laughs> so um, identifying those areas of weakness, and just because it's a weakness doesn't mean it's a negative thing, but it just means that now you found the area of improvement. And if you put yourself in a position where you do have the tools to improve, then you're ahead of the game. And interviewing is a whole nother, a whole nother skill in itself. And when you are interviewing, I think I said this earlier, being able to market yourself well is very important. When an employer or a potential employer asks you, so tell me about yourself, don't list from top to bottom your resume. They've read it and they know what's going on. But what I would say is just identify the key things that may be relevant to the position and tie that into why you're interested in the position where you can kind of kill two birds with one stone because I think usually after the tell me about yourself comes the, so why are you interested in? So you can say something like, I worked here, here, and here. And while I was doing these positions, I learned a lot about this, but I also wanted to develop my skills more in this. And I saw that 
these were the job responsibilities in this position. And that's why I was interested in applying. So being able to tie in your resume with what they're asking for is really important. And those are just a few of the skills that I wanted to share with people. And that's the reason why I, I launched it, especially for, um, for people of color, um, just because sometimes for us, it's like finding uh, mentors or figuring out how to, how to navigate this big job market is daunting sometimes. And um, my, my motto for people is, you know, be confident in yourself, um, be confident in your skills, be confident in what you bring to the table. And just know that when you have that internal confidence, it will be reflected and other people will feel that. Um, but yeah, I, I just really wanted to help people in, in a stronger way just be able to reach their goals. Because again, like I said, time and time again, I would be hearing people say, it's been five years since I graduated my MPH and I haven't found a job. By the way, if it's been five years, you come talk to me. <laughs> come talk to me, okay? <laughs> no, <laughs> like we, we, can, we can get you something. It's been five years, like, yeah, we can, we can figure something out. So, so yeah, just hearing those types of stories, really, I'm like, I know these people are qualified. I know they have the skills, but there's a disconnect somewhere that is not being addressed that I that I aim to address with my business. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think like going back to what you're saying about um, identifying your weaknesses and just being, I feel like it's just being self-aware of yourself is so important to, to a lot of things in life as well as like job, job interviewing, job searching, career searching. Um, so it's a really understanding what you're good at, what you're not good at, and how you can improve on those things is so important. And uh, shout out to your friends that you have in your corner for telling you to start the business now, because yeah. starting it in three years is going to be like, you're going to have the same sorts sort of thoughts that you had when you started started it now, the same, same thoughts of like, uh, like fumbles and all those kinds of things. I think it's just always good to just start now and like, you know, it will figure out itself. The, the sooner, the better, and and yeah. you just you just learn from all that that process. Um, so I'm I'm glad that you're doing that. Um, so what 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 has been like, what what is the the biggest issue that that you see with people that that come to you, and where where can people find find you for the for business services? By the way, for business services, I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram. On LinkedIn, I'm at Live consulting and career services on Instagram at I'm at live career services. Um, LinkedIn is definitely the platform that I get the most engagement, but on either platform, you can find me or send me an email if you'd like. Um, but I would say the, the biggest challenge that I've seen has been with the resume and with job interviews. When it comes to the resume, one thing that I've done with some clients is I'll set up a call with them just to go through their resume because sometimes what people write, it doesn't fully give me the picture of what they did. And I found that when I talk to people, they'll be telling me all of this great stuff. I'm like, why isn't this on your resume? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> like you talking to me and I'm like, wow, I kind of want to do what you're doing, but <laughs> I've not seen it on the resume. And I, I think people, it's like, it's not until they they talk it out. They're like, oh yeah, that should be on my resume. Um, or sometimes it's easy to take maybe the job description that you had applied for and kind of just like copy and paste it into the position, but that doesn't tell the full story. And I always say, if you can put a number in there, please do it. So I remember there was somebody I was interviewing for, and I think um, she was doing some, some COVID support. And the bullet said something like main calls for, or main calls to uh, COVID patients or mm -hmm. something like that that had to do with calls. So I asked her, I said, do you know how many calls that you did? And she was like, well, I did maybe like 20, 20 to 25 calls a day. And I said, okay, how many, how long have you been working in the position? And we did the calculations and it ended up being a big number. So something like, I made uh, or conducted over a thousand calls to XYZ patients really makes a big difference versus I make calls to patients because 
one, it shows like, okay, you've done something for a long time. If you do something a thousand times, you know what you're doing. <laughs> um, so uh, just kind of tweaking, tweaking some of those bullets and um, always tell people, hype yourself up in your resume. Like you did the work, hype yourself up. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can say what you did instead of saying support, like you can just use other synonyms that are stronger and that I think are a better, a better way to describe what you brought to the team. And I also say, if you developed a product, if you had any type of thing that was tangible, definitely include that on your, on your resume. But yeah, when it comes to resume, I think a lot of people maybe sometimes downplay their, their positions. I'm like, no, we got to upplay it. Of course, upplay it where it makes sense. <laughs> like, don't say that you were the manager of something, and, you know, you were the research assistant, like, don't do that. But when it's appropriate to upplay it, definitely upplay it and do that where in, in or do that at a time where you can support what you're saying. Um, and then also back to the interviews, um, preparing for the interview is very important. Um, and I think preparing for an interview is like almost preparing for a test and making sure that you understand just a little bit about the organization, being able to use some of their words and mix it into your interview or use some of their projects and say, oh, I was really interested in your health equity initiative. And I really thought that these aspects aligned with what I'm trying to do in the future. So I'm curious to see what this initiative looks like in your program right now. When you're asking questions, ask thoughtful questions, please. And also never end an interview. Somebody says, if you, or asks you if you have any questions, don't ever tell them that you don't have any questions. <laughs> <Don't> do <that. laughs> Um, even if it's just like a more personal question, like, how do you like your job? Mm -hmm. I, I asked that question because I think it's important to get that insight on, I'm like, okay, what's the most challenging part of your job? What's the part that you like about you, about what you're doing? Um, just having a set, a, a set of questions ready, maybe two or three, more than three. It's like, all right, it's time to get off the call. Like that's enough. <laughs> um, but just being prepared for the interviews is very important, um, but also not being afraid to be yourself when it's, um, you know, if you have an opportunity to show some of your personality, definitely do that. Because um, I don't think maybe in different industries, people like to work with robots, but I don't think that's the case for public health. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I echo everything that you just said there. I think that that is great, especially the part about like talking about the rules that you had, like talk about it with someone, because a lot of the times you are missing out on some key yes. things that you did that you don't have on your resume. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I agree with that. Definitely check out uh, Liv or Olivia or Liv Consulting and Career Services if, if you do need some more help, especially if you're five years out of your MPH and you can't find a job. Please do. <laughs> send an email just real quick. We'll set up a time to talk. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. So before I move you on to the uh, Furious Five last section of the show, I uh, wanted to ask you, where would you like to see yourself in the future? Mm, this is a question that I've been asked all the time, and it I feel like it changes by the month. <laughs> like, if you asked me this question before I started my business, I would say I would want to be in a director or leadership role within the next 10 years in somebody's organization, kind of making those high level decisions. Now I'm like, okay, well, I have a business. Do I want to be doing my business full time in the next 10 years? Or do I still want to be in those leadership positions? All I know is that I want to be in a role that has a positive impact on the people that I'm working with. So if I am in a leadership position when it comes to health policy, I would want to incorporate the community voice into those policies. If I am doing my business full time, I wanna be able to help as many people as I can and make connections and be able to connect people with others in their space or others that could possibly, possibly be mentors. So I'm kind of juggling between those two, who knows? I might end up doing both of them at the same time. Um, but yeah, it's still a work in progress. I'm always a work in progress. And I think it's a, it's a good thing to just continue working on yourself and, um, being open to, to change and new ideas. 
Yeah, and I, I think that that's very similar to me and like this growth mindset and like, okay, I see these new things, new opportunities, these things seem cool. I could probably do that in the future. And then next week you find something else and you know, I could do that in the future. And then, and I, and I do think um, definitely have it based in something, but, <laughs> but uh, I think it's good to, to think big and like just continually challenge what you think you want to do in the future. Because for myself, it also changes all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm moving you on to the Furious Five, the five questions I ask all guests. Okay. So, so number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? I would say reach out to as many people as you can. Uh, ask questions. Do not be afraid to create your own opportunities. Like I said at the beginning, all your opportunities may not be found on Indeed, LinkedIn, or a job posting and just utilize the resources that you have around you. Great advice. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, both as a manager and uh, the CEO and founder of your business, what advice would you give them? I would say start the work of figuring out who you are. Uh, I know that's kind of like cliche advice, but um, I think when you are doing that work and you understand your purpose, or at least what you want your purpose to be, it um, will make it easier to figure out your trajectory in, in terms of where you want to go. But I would also say network, 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 talk to as many people as you can, please. <laughs> um, there's so many people that would love to speak with you and would love to just tell you about what they do. Um, so don't be afraid to, to use LinkedIn. Don't be afraid to just send people random emails explaining what you want to do. You might get a couple people that say no. You might get people that don't even respond to you. But the people that you do get that get to respond to you, those are going to be the game changers for you. So don't be afraid to reach out to people and to talk to them about what you want to do and um, just to get a little bit, get to know a little bit more about um, about the field. Absolutely agree. Uh, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Hmm. Balance. Balance is definitely something I'm looking, I'm trying to improve. Um, and it's been a bit more difficult with, with COVID, but trying to prioritize, um, just overall health and, and well-being and incorporating exercise um, every day, trying to, right now I'm at like three, four times a week, but um, trying to just stay active and um, to manage stress better, um, but overall just balance and to prioritize things that um, don't just have to do with work. Yeah, I think a lot of us are trying to get through that balancing time, especially with uh, COVID-19 continuing to to do its thing, it right? It's a run through. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Um, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, outside of, of what I've said before in terms of networking, I don't, I don't think so. But I think the last thing I would say about that is just don't be afraid to kind of put yourself out there and don't be afraid of, of failure. Um, failure, I don't even like to use the word failure. I prefer to use learning experiences because anytime you fail at something, now you know that this way didn't work and it leads you to trying a different way. So being open for failure and like my mom always says, leave room for disappointment. Leaving that little room for disappointment, I think will really make a difference in one, your mental health, and two, in just staying positive and being open to different opportunities. You might have one opportunity, like for me, I've had several opportunities that I really, really, really wanted and they didn't fall through. But now I'm in a position that I really enjoy working with people that are great. So those positions that didn't work out were kind of a blessing in disguise. So just keeping an open mind, leaving room for disappointment, and just trusting that you will get to your goals if you put in the work. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, number five, last but not least, I should say, where can people connect with you? 
LinkedIn is definitely the best way to connect with me. So like I said earlier, my business page is Live Consulting and Career Services, but you can find me on LinkedIn, Olivia Umarin, and I am always looking to connect with new people. So if you're interested, definitely feel free to shoot me a message. I am very responsive, so I uh, would love to set up a time to chat. Feel free. Um, I'm an open book. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and you. uh, sharing all your insights. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. This was this was so great. And I just want a quick shout out to you for doing this because this is such an important thing to have and a great resource for students and professionals to use when it comes to trying to figure out this crazy career journey that all of us are on. So big shout out to you. And I hope that um, you have continued success with this much much appreciate so just just creating things that i think i would have used if, if when when i needed it and it wasn't there so so i'm yeah. glad to do it and uh, i appreciate that a lot thank you so much and then uh housekeeping items everyone be sure to subscribe be sure to like this video leave a review if you haven't as yet D definitely share with a friend helps the show get out to more people and if you'd like to support you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash ph millennial uh see you all next week